We have at uh, at my organization we have one project on ancient history of uh, digital, including games and computers and um, and narratives developed around it. And we have two PhD students doing research with University of Colorado. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's very interesting to see how little, in a way, has changed in some way, yeah. while we have many other changes. Well, well, I have. Uh a bit of history on my table. So I'm in the office right now. So a bit of history on my table, if you can see, it's uh, right Ah, here. that's it. <laughs> Is it AT or XT? Uh, it's uh, Olivetti. So it's in between of XT and AT. It's Olivetti M24. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I got it as a gift for my birthday because it's exactly the same or very, very same computer on which was infected where I turned to the computer of virus research and cybersecurity. That was exactly almost the same computer. So actually I had a gift <laughs> with this computer uh, and uh, actually it is infected with the <laughs> same virus. So this floppy disk is infected with the same computer virus. <laughs> Great intro, Eugene. You really provide us with the historical context. Now that's we have to see what will uh, happen, what is happening now, and what will happen in future. As the church will like to say. I think my first computer was an Atari 800 with a tape cassette tape drive that uh, was hard for it to get any viruses back then. It wasn't popular enough. <laughs> Christopher and Eugene, I'm worried that we are re revealing our age with this information. You know? Too late on that one, I think. <laughs> Do you remember what's this? Oh, the, those are cards for the, oh my God, that's... I took a class at, uh, at Johns Hopkins learning how to program on those in, uh, in Fortran and then Lisp. <laughs> Eugene, it is uh, 82, 83? Uh, 80s. 80s. Do you remember this? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I have something. <laughs> okay, I have some funny stuff here. I highly recommend everyone goes to the Bletchley Park Museum uh, that has not only uh, the rooms rebuilt where they broke the, uh, the Nazi codes, but they also have a museum of computing history that has hard disks the size of like your car and other things there. It's great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All worth seeing. Uh, I'm not sure about other museums, uh, but in uh, Munich, there is a very first uh, electric computer, which was made by a German guy. What was the name of that guy? The, it was like, a, the name of computers was Z1, Z2, Z3, like this, in 40s, during the Second World War. So I had a picture and staying in front of this computer, then a computer is the uh, uh, electronic, cal cal electronic calculating machine. That's it. Christopher uh, uh, has a, a lovely background uh, from another machine which determined is, the outcome of Second World War. This is the original Colossus, the first digital programmable electronic computer that broke the Lorenz code, the Nazi high command Lorenz code. And the Brits kept it secret until the mid 70s. So I think they lost their, their leg up by that. but. It's great. You can see this at the Bletchley Park Museum. Uh -huh. Cool. Well, I hope the Chengeta will uh, will tolerate our historical part of our session, <laughs> or we should uh, we should be moving into into media res. I'm waiting okay. just for him from Chengeta. Moving from the past to the future. Yeah, you know what Churchill said: uh, of, uh, in order to look forward, you have to see, to also see backward, that's, that's that interplay, which is always important. It's exactly, especially when you're speaking about technologies and uh, the human behavior technologies. Have to predict what the cyber criminals are going to do next. Okay, so learn what- I, they do I think you can start now, actually. We are oh, four minutes right. behind, yes. Thank you, Chengatai. Uh, great for uh, all, of, uh, all of you. I really enjoyed the, uh, enormously this uh, intro and uh, some sort of time machine uh, with um, um, our panelists today, with uh, the Eugene, with uh, Christopher and uh, other colleagues. Uh, and what we started as uh, with uh, some sort of message that in order to see forward, we have also to re reflect on history and the past. 
especially on this interplay between technology and security. And my name is Jovan Kurvalje. I'm the head of uh, Geneva Internet Platform uh, and uh, director of Diplo Foundation. I used to be co-director of the high level panel on digital cooperation. It's my great honor to be today, today here with you to introduce uh, our panelists through the, through the uh, uh, time zones and through the way what they're seeing now. I'm connecting from the quite ghostly building of the UN here in Geneva. It's empty, uh, not only because of pandemics, but it is almost 7, 7.30. We have uh, two of our colleagues in uh, in uh, um, uh, day uh, day time zones. We have uh, uh, the uh, Itsumi Nakamitsu, the UN Under Secretary General of Disarmament Affairs, connecting from New York, and we have Christopher Painter, President of Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. Chris is connecting from Washington D.C. Chris is uh, one of the first uh, cyber uh, diplomats uh, in the from the U.S. administration. Then we have uh, um, two panelists who are making real efforts to join us uh, in the, uh, this night uh, uh, zones. Uh, first, uh, Eugene Kaspersky. Uh, I'm sure that there is no need to introduce Eugene, CEO of uh, Kaspersky, and uh, very, well uh, very well versed into the history of computer science. That should be probably topic for some good uh, podcast or, or uh, even a book, Eugene. Uh, further to the east uh, um, uh, is um, our um, uh, dear colleague um, uh, Lata Reddy, co-chair of the Global Commission on, on the Stability of Cyberspace, another experienced cyber diplomat. And uh, Lata, thank you for joining us. It's midnight in New Delhi, and that's really appreciated. Now let me come back to the this uh, middle zone, Euro Euro African, uh, to introduce the uh, other other panelists today. We have uh, uh, John Denton joining us from Paris. John is the Secretary General of the International Chamber of, uh, of Commerce. And we have Enrico uh, Calandro, co-director of C3 uh, Southern Africa and chair of GFC Research Committee. That's more or less geography of, uh, of today's, uh, today's session. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Chengeta and the organizers of today's session to introducing some sort of time fairness. Usually our colleagues in Americas have to wake up early in the morning or stay late in the evening. And that's, there is a, some sort of rebalance in, in that respect. Now, today's uh, major topic for our discussion is, uh, is the question of cybersecurity. And uh, I will just try in a few minutes to paint the canvas or backdrop for our discussion today before I pass the floor for our eminent speakers and an excellent panel. Well, we are all familiar uh, with what is going on around us and how the digital technology helps humanity to have uh, some sort of uh, societal business continuity over the last seven or eight months, uh, thanks to the robust digital infrastructure, students continue studying online, uh, we uh, were provided with even uh, rather simple facilities, but important in the times of lockdown of ordering food or working online. And sometimes it is given how the technical infrastructure, how the digital infrastructure really sustained in this difficult time. And I think we should be proud, all of, especially those of you who are involved in ensuring that uh, digital technology function. It is the major, major achievement. In this process of uh, uh, changes, uh, what has happened, digital companies, tech companies became uh, more important, more relevant, and more dependence on the digital technology creating new vulnerabilities. And we will address them, address them in a few minutes. Therefore, this is the general uh, backdrop. Now, more specifically, Cyber security issues and digital policy issues are raising in relevance in uh, forums and international meetings uh, worldwide. Now we are finishing the first week of Internet uh, Governance Forum, and um, uh, cyber security has not been picking up so much. Probably there was a need to have this uh, important session uh, and then to have uh, more discussion on cyber security next week. Now, before I pass the floor to our, uh, our panelists, I would like to ask Luis to pose the, the, put a survey to see 
what is the atmosphere in the room when it comes to the question of uh, cybersecurity vulnerabilities? I hope that technology will serve us. If not, we'll be moving directly into discussion. Luis. Okay. Well, the question is, as you can see, is the current turbulent times? For many, the internet is essential to work, relax and stay in touch with family and friends. How secure do you feel online regardless of whether you use the internet for professional, family or leisure? Bit long question, but what is your feeling about security of the internet? You feel very secure, secure, not particularly secure or insecure, unsecure and very unsecure. Let me see what will be the, the answer from our colleagues here in the room. Unfortunately, those who are following on YouTube, and I guess there are more of them on YouTube, cannot participate in this survey. Okay, we'll be getting the news soon. And uh, in the meantime, we'll be seeing from Luis what is the Result, okay. Well, we feel quite secure, not particularly secure, unsecure, very unsecure. It's a typical distribution when you ask this type of questions, but the answer is somewhere in the, in the middle and we will uh, we'll see if reality is also, also uh, distributed in the same way. Okay, we, this is the general backdrop for our discussion today. And we move with the first intervention uh, from uh, Under Secretary General uh, Nakamitsu. Um, Zumi, the question is what do you see as a threat to international IC uh, security posed by COVID 19? What are the main uh, priorities or main concerns uh, at the place where you are? You are in the middle of the uh, negotiation, different policy processes on cybersecurity, sometimes complex. As we know, there are two parallel processes. What do you see as the, as the threats uh, for inter international ICT security? Over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jovan. Um, uh, what a fascinating uh, members on the panel. Um, I would like to really congratulate you for putting together. Um, and, and I like the way you started, actually, I mean, they, you know, the internet or the, the digital technologies have uh, definitely provided enormous opportunities, but I would like to add to that just a compliment is that it is going to transform our lives, every aspect of our life, uh, work, daily life, uh, stay in touch, uh, etc. Um, what we are now experiencing is a transformative changes. Uh, that is happening around the world. And, and that, of course, has an impact on where I am actually sitting. Uh, I am um, responsible, at the, responsible for international security and disarmament issues at the United Nations. Um, of course, the downside of this uh, positive, um, you know, generally positive ICT technologies uh, during the crisis is, of course, you know, this uh, change has been also accompanied by enormous spike in, in cyber incidents. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the ITU, the International Telecommunications uh, Union, has estimated that internet usage has increased during the pandemic by something like 30%. Uh, but uh, in terms of cyber attacks or cyber incidents, um, the increase was actually almost uh, 300%. Um, so, you know, you can see the, um, the enormous impact on the downside as well, uh, even though there are a lot of positive, a uh, lot of transformative and positive uh, benefits that these uh, technologies uh, are uh, bringing to us. And of course, our deep uh, concern is the mounting malware campaigns against critical infrastructures, and especially during the COVID crisis, um, you know, hospitals, medical research facilities, and other institutions uh, all the, over the past several months. And, and that includes uh, the World Health Organization, for example. Uh, I'm told that uh, WHO has reported um, experiencing more than five times the number of cyber attacks than in the same period last year. So these uh, incidents are obviously compounding people's already widespread sense of insecurity around uh, their health, uh, livelihood, and, and future. Of course, the ordinary people 
uh, are experiencing, you know, this uh, rapid num uh, increase of uh, fishing, uh, spear fishing uh, incidents, um, um, etc. The malware, uh, uh, you know, emails, uh, uh, etc. Um, and of course, um, what we are wondering is whether this would also have a deep impact on uh, more hardcore international peace and security issues. Um, of, um, the, the, the kinds of uh, cyber attacks that we are um, seeing, we are witnessing, um, is of course stopped short of a, a, a traditional uh, use of force type of situations. It's not a kinetic scene. Uh, but um, it is increasingly posing a very difficult questions as to what it is that we are actually looking at in terms of a very uh, serious cyber incidents that could potentially happen impacting on critical infrastructures that are um, uh, you know, deeply uh, uh, connected or uh, related to uh, stability and security uh, of, uh, of our general environment. Um, so this is for this, this reason, uh, the Secretary General Guterres has indeed uh, drawn attention to cyber attacks during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And he uh, has been repeatedly calling on the international community to do more to prevent and also end uh, cyber attacks on critical civilian infrastructure, including um, healthcare facilities. Um, I will stop here for now and, and looking forward to, um, you know, more in-depth discussions uh, in terms of what we need to do uh, to uh, making sure that first and foremost prevent and also ending cyber attacks. Thank you. Thank you, and the Secretary. Thank you, um, uh, Izumi, for great uh, painting of the landscape, including rather shocking numbers about discrepancy between raise in the use of the internet 30% and the uh, 300% in the cyber cyber attacks. Numbers are useful to give us some sort of bearing of the of the overall situation. And definitely we'll be coming back to the quite a few points that you raised in introductory statement on the actions from the UN Secretary General, on the actions and activities of your office, which are uh, very, very important for the global global cyber cyber security. There was one interesting comment uh, coming from the uh, Amir Hossein. Uh, he commented on my uh, sort of map of the time zones, and he introduced the first uh, interesting point that cybersecurity threats are as diverse as the time zones. This is just one, one challenging point for our discussion. Do we discuss the same similar or diverse type of cyber challenges? Now, uh, there is no need to introduce Eugene. He introduced himself uh, greatly about, the, about the, uh, this survey of history of uh, computer, computers, and uh, it triggered a fascinating discussion in the chat with mentioning of Fortran, Cobol, uh, Sinclair, and other, other tools. I can see that uh, the age distribution of the current panel is, uh, is more to those of us who used to start using computers in 80s and 90s. But we would like to hear also from the from younger generation about their, uh, their concerns. Eugene, uh, you have been, your company has been uh, providing really deep detailed summary of cyber attacks and, uh, and the painting of the current landscape. And you have this uh, excellent useful tool that we use, for example, for our courses when we teach cybersecurity on the, what is the current uh, threat situation. Could you, in, a, in, a, uh, in your first intervention, help in uh, painting this uh, overall uh, current cybersecurity situation based on the both data and your general insights, and then maybe hint to some actions that you have been um, suggesting or taking, and then we will be developing them throughout the discussion. Over to you. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, well, actually, the, the situation during the COVID time uh, in the cyberspace is, uh, well, more dangerous, of course, obviously more dangerous than before. Uh, and uh, well, actually, there are two factors which uh, activate the cyber crime. Uh, the first factor is that many people, they stay at home, so they spend more time in the internet. Uh, so the bad guys, uh, they, 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 have, they can easily hack the more victims than before. Uh, the second uh, factor is uh, that many enterprises, well, most of our companies, they send employees home. Uh, but they are not able to guarantee the same level of security as in uh, with, within the corporate perimeter. Uh, so the people are left at home uh, with some 
uh, basic security, but they can access the enterprise network. So the, the criminals, they use this uh, to hack. They, they, they hack the uh, home computers uh, to access uh, the enterprise networks. Uh, that's why we see there, uh, also we see the increase of the number of the hackers attacks, uh, the activity of cyber criminals. Uh, and actually we have uh, quite a detailed data uh, even for countries, uh, because we have our customers, uh, they are based in many uh, countries around the world. So we see our sensors, see the statistics of the criminal activities. Uh, so if you want to uh, see more details, just visit our website, uh, securelist.com. Uh, and there's a statistic page, uh, so you can see this data there. Uh, speaking about the malicious code, I will say that uh, it's about 20, 25 increase in numbers of new malicious applications. Uh, so before COVID, we were collecting uh, about 350,000 new malicious applications, new malicious files a day. So every day, about 350,000 new malicious files, which we never saw before. Right now, we collect more than 400,000 malicious files a day. Uh, it means that the global cyber crime is getting more active. And actually, I don't know how many people are in, uh, in this business. Uh, 10,000, 100,000, well, actually, the, the numbers are huge. A uh, number of the attacks and different, the different tools developed by the bad guys. Uh, so the, the global cyber crime is massive, but uh, in most of cases, uh, that's uh, technically it's not really a problem to protect, uh, protect people, protect uh, uh, computer smartphones, uh, devices from this kind of the attacks, because most of them, they're junior. Uh, so they're not too much complicated. Uh, so technically speaking, it's not a problem to release the antidote for this kind of uh, uh, computer malware or cyber malware. Uh, there, uh, the rising problem is that many of these uh, junior cyber criminals, uh, they're getting more smart, they are getting more experienced, and they join professional hackers team, or they lead, they create the new uh, highly professional cyber gangs. Uh, and at the moment, we are monitoring, it's about 200 of uh, professional cyber gangs, which develop uh, quite uh, uh, sophisticated cyber attacks. Uh, and they're able to hack even very well protected organizations like banks, uh, governments. So actually, this is a problem to protect uh, the system from their targeted attacks, highly complicated, sophisticated, uh, and unfortunately, in some cases, very successful kind of the malicious tools. And uh, at the same time, speaking about the physical systems, the infrastructure, the critical infrastructure, uh, well, we, we have uh, more and more reports that uh, the criminal gangs, uh, they access, they, they try to, well, not, it's not targeted attacks, but they try uh, to, they touch uh, infrastructure, they touch the SCADA systems which are connected to the internet. And uh, we don't have too many uh, reports of the targeted attacks on the systems. Uh, it seems that they just, they, they see uh, that they're not just uh, uh, individuals, not just uh, the computer networks, office networks connected to the internet. Uh, they see the physical infrastructure. They, uh, in most of cases, they don't know what to do with that. But I am afraid in the future, the criminals, uh, they will easily recognize the power uh, of attacks on the physical infrastructure. And I'm afraid that uh, we are living in times uh, when the criminals, they're turning to uh, SCADA systems uh, from attacks on individuals, attacks on the office networks, uh, enterprise office networks, uh, turning to the uh, physical systems, to turning to SCADA. Uh, well, they are already in Internet of Things. Uh, they were botnet, Mirai botnet, infecting the security cameras, video cameras. Uh, and actually, that was one of the most successful cyber attack, global attack, and uh, living for years. Uh, so I'm afraid the next is uh, uh, massive attacks uh, on the infrastructure, on the physical infrastructure. Not like now, so there's just very, very few cases, actually, uh, targeted cases. But I'm afraid in the future, the situation will be changed. And unfortunately, this uh, evolution of cybercrime is really, really uh, activated uh, by uh, COVID times because there's so many victims online. Uh, criminals, they're humans as well, so they stay at home <laughs> as other people do, so they have more time uh, to 
improve the technologies to improve the, uh, the activity. So actually, I'm afraid that situation uh, with cybercrime is getting from bad to worse. Uh, so that's why the importance of cybersecurity and uh, active measures about uh, the, the criminals is getting more and more important. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. I hope that we have the uh, vaccine for the, this type of the virus that is uh, coming into, into our uh, computers. But this is the question that we may re reflect later on. You introduced quite a few uh, uh, important uh, elements, including this increasing vulnerability in the dynamics between home and, uh, and the office, which is completely new element. Also element uh, of uh, professional versus uh, newcomers into the cyber crime field. This is the profession in itself, which has its own uh, logic and dynamics and uh, subculture like all criminal organizations. Therefore, we may later on reflect on, on it uh, and on it a bit more. Uh, we are in the well, uh, similar time zone, moving a bit east towards, uh, towards the Lata. Lata uh, uh, we are now uh, getting these threads into our uh, tapestry of today's session with the Izumi bring the, the links from the UN, Eugene from the, let's say, trenches of the cyber, uh, cyber security where he is protecting many computers worldwide. And uh, we would like to hear from you on your experience as cyber diplomat and also person involved in geopolitics. Therefore, we are connecting now individual business level to the global level. Over to you, Lata. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Johan. And uh, given my background as a cyber diplomat, as you described me, for me, the key problem or challenge uh, is now the difficulties in advancing dialogues on preventing cyber attacks, uh, even in a critical area like the health sector. Uh, because you know, if we can't agree on a norm to say that attacks on the health sector are unacceptable during a global pandemic, uh, then really the purpose of international cooperation is not being served very well. Uh, in the present tense geopolitical climate and the tense relationships between major powers, it's very hard to focus on really vital international cooperation in policy issues. But cyber has never been more important and dialogue on cybersecurity has also never been more important than it is today. If we were to look at intergovernmental inter tensions today, uh, we could see in the context of what I'd like to call a possible tech war, you can see five fronts emerging, you can see the question of resources, you can see the question of network infrastructures, you can see the question of operating systems, you can see platforms, and you can see content and data. There's, I would say, almost at the moment, a Cold War-like situation prevailing between uh, major powers. Uh, but fortunately, due to globalization, we do not have an iron curtain between the opponents. The curtain we have today is flexible, porous, and not opaque. Perhaps we can call it the bamboo curtain, uh, to quote Nitin Pai of Takshashila, I like this term. Uh, in other words, we can find a way to cooperate, provided everybody agrees that this is a global challenge. And agrees that in pandemic times, certain things must be out of bounds for cyber attacks. How, how can countries cope? We should continue our dialogues on internet cooperation, uh, internet go governance, on international cooperation, and possibly on safeguarding the health sector through a universally agreed norm. And we should simultaneously build bubbles of technology trust with our strategic partners. I'll come back to this idea of bubbles of trust later in my intervention. But I hope this sets it in the context of diplomacy, international cooperation, and norm building. Thank you.
we have a cold war in making, but there is no iron curtain yet. Diplomacy facilitates dialogue, but not uh, as effective yet as it should be. Focus on the norms in the most critical sectors like uh, health sector and develop uh, more cooperation. Great inputs in, uh, in uh, our uh, in making uh, all uh, this cybersecurity canvas uh, vivid and relevant. Now from uh, the UN uh, business sector, uh, geopolitical uh, aspects from Latvia, we are moving to again to business sector, but to John uh, Denon, uh, Secretary General of International Chamber of uh, Commerce, place where uh, I guess many questions and some complaints around cybersecurity are coming from a Chamber of Commerce worldwide and also small and medium enterprises. Uh, John, what would be your uh, uh, input on this question? What are the major cybersecurity challenges that we are facing uh, in COVID-19 crisis, especially from the business perspective? Over to you. Well, thanks so much, Jordan. It's great to be on the panel and it's great to be back at the uh, IGF. I'm sorry we're not there in person, but that's just the way it works. Um, maybe I can put it a little bit differently. Uh, I actually see a paradox. Uh, uh, let's, let's be very clear. So the International Chamber of Commerce, we're the institutional voice of 45, 46 million businesses now. Uh, and we know that COVID-19 has had a real and dramatic impact on what we call the real economy. And the real economy is actually the way in which SMEs, micro SMEs interact. And they've been subject to the extraordinary supply shock and demand shock. We've seen lots of supply chains. We've seen uh, uh, the, the economic impact beating them up even before the uh, health problems got to them. And so it's actually been a really troubled time. One way that we've been working with the SMEs is we've actually run a major campaign called Save Our SMEs. And part of that has actually been to uh, work on the digitalization of, uh, of SMEs and micro SMEs. Because I think as you all understand, and I think as Eugene said, and, and uh, Ambassador Nzumi said as well, and you, you know, in this time of COVID, what we've seen is because of social distancing, the need to actually go online. And so we've been enabling that. The paradox, of course, is we've been enabling that at exactly the same time as we've seen not the new feature, which is these kind of dark menacing players, these kind of robbers or the, the black hearted, as I think Eugene almost described them, playing in this space as well. So we've actually been encouraging mass uptake of digitization for SMEs and micro SMEs. At the same time, this has been a dramatic increase in malware, phishing, all those sorts of attacks on SMEs and micro SMEs. And of course, one of the challenges is that SMEs and micro SMEs don't operate as independent entities always. They're actually integral parts of, of supply chains. So what's actually happening here is the weakest link arguably in a supply chain is being attacked. So what we're actually seeing is an increased um, vulnerability of the real economy to attacks through cybersecurity in the heart of COVID-19 and the response. And yet the only way we can effectively respond economically is in a way to suck up that risk. And then what we have to do is actually find tools, find approaches that can manage that. And I was very much taken by uh, Ambassador Reddy's comment but what we actually need to grapple with this is not just um, more training, uh, more concern. We actually need really effective interplay between government, the private sector, civil society to actually develop up a framework, but also a culture which actually puts cyber risk as a classic risk that needs to be managed. We can't eradicate cyber risk. I think uh, Eugene could show us exactly why we can't eradicate it, but we can treat dealing with it as a process that we need to manage. And what we do need in order to enable that to happen is a lot more cooperation. We still see too few company countries actually take up some of the most important elements in terms of computer emergency response task forces, et cetera. And we do need a recognition that this is a global problem. So frankly, wealthier countries, wealthier companies need to be helping, investing in supporting the development of the tools to enable the SMEs and micro SMEs to no longer be the weakest links but actually to actually enable themselves to build resilience so that they can participate in the real economy effectively and save lives and livelihoods and manage a process which can actually limit the impact of cyber risk. That's what we see and that's what we think needs to happen. Because frankly, we will, as I said, this paradox continues. We have just launched a major campaign to digitize a further 5 million SMEs and micro SMEs so that they can go forward and actually operate 
in the 21st century, but particularly be part of the economic recovery. John, a fascinating survey of the current situation in the modern economy. Thank you. Thank you for that. And you triggered one, one, one thought on one question for our uh, audience and for our panelists that we may come to later on. Whom we call when we have a problem, we as a SME or we as a citizens or we as a countries? Uh, is it a company help desk or do we need the help desk with governments or international help desk? For us here in the panel, I'm at the panel in the session, I'm sure that we are aware of uh, 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 certs and other and the bodies. But for a young person just starting startup company or a citizen, that may be a challenge. Therefore, this is just one question that we may try to reflect on. Very simple question: bringing geopolitical issues to reality of the of the people worldwide. Wow, that's a great session. Thank you. Thank you. It's so easy to moderate it with such a great, great inputs. Uh, and now we move to Chris. Chris is in DC. There is no need to introduce uh, Chris Painter um, um, now in his current role as the president of Global Forum Cyber Expertise. Chris, I know you can reflect on so many issues, but what would you pick up from the threads developing so so far and develop them further? Over to you. Well, you know, it was great hearing the other panelists. I sort of feel like a lot of the things have been said, and uh, you know, there's this old saying. Everything's been said, but I haven't said it yet. So uh, I'll try to avoid that and actually talk about some new things. I mean, obviously, I think the pandemic has just highlighted what we're already seeing. We're seeing great threats to uh, to cyberspace, to both on an individual level, on a nation state level, transnational criminal groups, nation states, others who are involved in this. Um, and that's just accelerated with COVID because I think it's, it's uh, highlighted our vulnerabilities and our dependencies on these systems. Uh, and that's hardly a surprise. It's unfortunate. Every time we've had a major like uh, disaster of any kind, there are always this group of criminals who try to attack that and and take advantage of it. So it's it's hardly surprising. It's 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 unfortunate though. So so what does that highlight for me? Well, a couple of things. At one, you know, we're seeing these kinds of threats. I'm still worried about new threats. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, my my uh, friend, the former president of Estonia, Thomas Silvis, always talks about a threat and worry about the integrity of information. And I worry about denial of service attacks. I worry about thefts. I worry more if someone breaks into a hospital and actually changes my blood type so the next time I get a transfusion, I die, or that financial markets can't settle. We haven't seen that much yet, but I think that could be the wave of the future, and we have to worry about that. But what it says to me is two things. One, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. To the extent there's any silver lining to COVID, and there's really not much of one, it's that it has shown to countries around the world, both developing countries and developed countries, that this is an area of real priority, that we're so dependent on these systems that cybersecurity can't be treated as just this boutique throw-off issue, but it is a core issue for all of us. And it needs to be treated as a core political issue, a core issue that is a national security issue, uh, an economic prosperity issue, a human rights issue, and also ultimately a foreign policy issue. Uh, you know, in, in terms of diplomacy, Back when my office was created back in 2011, we were the first ones in the world at that time to dedicate these issues. There are about 40 and growing around the world, and that's important because it's being treated not just as this technical issue, and the technical aspects are clearly important, but as a policy issue. And just like you don't need to be a nuclear engineer to understand the, the aspects of nuclear policy, you don't need to be a coder to understand the, the national security, economic, and human rights implications of cybersecurity and how we do that. So that's one thing I think is really important. That it leads, it gives us an opportunity to mainstream this issue like we haven't done before, and we need to do that. The, the second thing I'd say is it highlights for me the, the necessity, and this shouldn't be surprising coming from my perspective as now the, the president of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise Foundation, uh, the necessity for capacity building around the world and capacity building in many different ways. The capacity building to help countries both developing countries and developed countries. Again, there's lots of developing countries who, who do not have the expertise, the resources, the structures in place, the national strategies. We have to work with those. And that's something that uh, my organization, which is a multi-stakeholder organization, which includes uh, nations, you know, like 60 countries, over 60 countries, civil society, the private sector, academia, has been really focused on trying to coordinate some of that capacity building. But also the kind of policy capacity building that's around you know, how do you engage in these diplomatic debates that are happening in the UN that Sumi and, and, and others have talked about. So I think we need to be able to do more on that level too. So 
So it gives us an opportunity to do that, but we need to really, again, treat capacity building and cyber as not some odd duck, but really as a, a core part, a foundational part for our future prosperity and a foundational part of the UN's development goals as well. But the last thing I wanted to touch on was uh, just talking about the role of diplomacy. And I, I do think diplomacy and negotiations that are happening now are critically important. I think the norms that were agreed to in 2015 are critically important. We need to continue to get those implemented around the world and understood around the world. The confidence building measures, spreading those through regional and other organizations, critically important. How international law applies is important to all of our safety and security and stability going forward. But we also have to make sure there's accountability for transgressors. And, and I don't mean escalatory accountability. I mean accountability so that you know, we all hold account those who break these, these rules, these understandings. Uh, but we need to think about the, how we can do that as a world community. And, and again, I think that goes hand in glove with developing the rules of the road is how do you, you, know, how do you make sure that there's accountability for those. Uh, and, and lastly, I just say that that, again, all folds into this idea of capacity building, which is the discussions in New York, almost everyone mentioned this, and that was pre-COVID. And now I hear it even more post-COVID uh, when we're doing everything virtually. And, and that's a good thing. You know, there's this saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, I don't wanna be quite that crass, but I would say we need to make sure that we don't lose this opportunity, that people don't forget how important this is. And when we see these attacks on hospitals and others that we actually have a way to elevate this issue to prime ministers, to presidents, to CEOs at companies uh, outside of the cyber club that we're all in. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I think that we are doing very well on your plea to build the communication between different policy communities. We haven't been using uh, jargon. We did a bit at the, in the pre-session with the history, but it was uh, tolerated. But throughout the session, we stayed very careful uh, uh, away from the technological or diplomatic or policy jargon. And it is a great, and I think we should uh, continue in the, in the same way. Uh, Chris, there is one, one potential controversial topic for discussion. While I completely agree with your view that policy circles, the leaders, diplomats should be aware and should be aware of the political aspects of uh, technology. We have to see what are the pot potentials of security by design and how far we can go with security by design. I know that Eugene has been uh, uh, thinking a lot and working on that and we'll hear later on in the second uh, iteration about this interplay between security by design technical solution versus, versus diplomatic political uh, uh, solution. Once more, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Chris. Now in this, this lovely interplay, we move to, to technology again. Enrico Calandro joining us from uh, Cape Town. Enrico, what is your take on, uh, on this uh, discussion between policy, diplomacy, geostrategy, technology, economy? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jovan, for, for having me at this um, high-level panel. Um, I think it's interesting to see that actually there are so many participants online, uh, I would say at a relatively uh, late time in our time zone and also uh, towards East, meaning that probably people feel safer online than offline. <laughs> or maybe that's unfortunately the result of these uh, restrictions resulting from COVID-19. But um, so the perspective that actually I would like to provide, I'm a so social scientist by, by profession. So uh, I, I'll try to describe how new forms of cyber mediated um, processes can become a threat to human security. So I'm gonna talk about people um, with a focus also on developing countries because that's the focus of my activities and, and, and research. So uh, COVID-19 has shown to all of us um, that good quality, affordable and ubiquitous access to the internet is not a luxury, uh, but it's a critical lifeline. And in developing countries, actually access to the internet is still a, a luxury for, for the majority of people. So any barriers that actually stop us from using the internet in a safe and secure way, threaten to strip us of this uh, lifeline. Um, in developing countries, cyber threats and risks um, are an extension of uh, the persistent and increasing digital uh, inequalities that have grown together with, uh, with digitalization. Uh, uh, the, the current stat, uh, state of uh, cybersecurity vulnerabilities uh, illustrates a considerable security gap beyond the digital um, divide gap, uh, which is exacerbating existing patterns of inequality. For, for individuals, for countries, and for regions. 
Now, if we take a, a human centric perspective to cybersecurity, I think that four main threats have become particularly problematic from a policy perspective because policy and political responses uh, have not been able actually to tackle these problems that there is some barrier also of, of addressing them from a cybersecurity point of view that normally, you know, addresses issues of technical nature, IT and computer and network securities. And here I'm referring to uh, the so-called infodemic and the COVID-19 related cybercrime, online violence and risks of increased state surveillance. So uh, these four phenomena have either emerged from the pandemic or have been uh, exacerbated with the pandemic or have compromised the response of different countries to COVID-19. So from the point of view of internet diffusion in the African um, continent, um, which is uh, probably as we know, characterized by novel and first time users that are using the internet through the mobile phone and primarily on social media, uh, I think it becomes clear that the population is highly vulnerable to infodemic. The main danger of infodemic is that it speeds up the uh, epidemic process by influencing and fragmenting responses to fight uh, against the virus and the pandemic. Uh, then partially related um, to, to the infodemic and, and, and I think uh, certainly growing from it is the phenomenon of COVID-19 related cybercrime and we actually uh, talked a little bit about that because but infodemic can also be a vector of large scale cyber attacks. And that's what we have seen as well. So cyber criminals, you know, spread messages to plant uh, malware, uh, phishing credentials, or ask for Bitcoins donations. Um, but campaign of, of this information can actually facilitate cyber attacks also based on the exploitation of other human vulnerabilities, such as fears, anxieties, and they can also foment uh, racist and xenophobic behavior. Um, another pandemic, which I think has been exa ex exacerbated by the COVID-19 outbreak um, and increased internet use, uh, is the pandemic of online violence, and especially against women and girls, uh, and also uh, against people experiencing um, multiple forms of discrimination and vulnerability at the intersection between gender, age, uh, education, and other uh, social demographics. So as digitalization becomes more pervasive also in developing countries, the reality that the problem is getting worse is not improving. Um, the last threat um, is related to an increasing number of these tracking and, tra and contact tracing technologies to identify and support um, quarantine. Um, tracking and tracing technologies are important to find the pandemic as we know, uh, but surveillance needs to be done in compliance with the data protection regulation and uh, due respect for privacy and, conf and confidentiality. But it might be ineffective in countries with low levels of smartphone diffusion, uh, because people you can't, you can't simply collect data, and it can also place citizens at, at risk of privacy violation in jurisdictions with poor data protection frameworks. Or, or in countries that have uh, difficulties in enforcing these frameworks with, uh, with, 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 um, where the legis legislation is actually present. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Enrico, for enriching what, uh, what uh, Chris started with the uh, human rights, uh, societal, legal, and other aspects of cybersecurity discussion, which cannot be discussed in isolation and bringing infodemics and all of this concept. Our apology for uh, some uh, problems with uh, with unmuting, muting. Um, this is going to be definitely the key word of the 2020. Can you hear me or unmute yourself or mute? Therefore, I think it's now fixed. Uh, we have uh, all these threads from the first iteration of the of the your introductory statements. We are receiving quite a few interesting uh, questions, and I will just read uh, read them, question and comments, before. I invite you to, to, to comment on the, those few issues that emerged in the, in the first part of the session. Uh, Mike Nelson, great regards uh, for, to, to Mike. Uh, he say uh, two question, three words. We don't see the questions, but three words are encryption, digital and ID. Maybe some of you can comment on this cybersecurity trinity. Amir Hussein Mokaberi, there is there are two camps. Some countries want to regulate cyber conflicts and some want to prevent cyber conflict. Recognizing the cyberspace as a fifth domain of war, warfare rather than as a civilian and only peaceful environment will have 
to which camp? That's an interesting question, especially for those of you interested involved in geopolitics. Uh, Jacques Be uh, Benglier, uh, great regards uh, to Jacques. Drawing from the Soviet COVID discussion, should citizens, including corporate citizens, be patronized, enforced, sanctioned to protect themselves from cyber dangers, or should this be prohibited as a restriction of personal freedom, freedom of doing business? Well, we won't have a boring discussion, I can see, and I invite the, the, our attendees, uh, including uh, one of the fathers of the internet, Wint Surf, best regards to Wint, uh, to uh, bring uh, their comments and, uh, and the questions. Now we are going to the second iteration of, uh, of the, based on the, these questions and the leads from the initial discussion. And we'll uh, um, um, ask uh, Izumi um, and the Secretary Nakamitsu, could you tell us what uh, has been achieved under the auspices of the UN? Izumi, you have heard uh, many sort of uh, inputs on uh, current situation, concern, threats and risk. What is happening at the UN and what we can expect from the UN in this context of answering the, some of these concerns? Over to you. Okay, thank you. I feel that, um, you know, the panelists, definitely all of the panelists and, and also vast majority of uh, the people in the audience, they are already fully aware of um, what has been achieved at the United Nations and what is going on currently uh, in the UN. Um, I mean, but just to, to recap very, very quickly, um, of course, the UN has been tackling this issue for many years now. There are six iterations of what, what we call the group of groups of governmental experts that, you know, they have been studying and analyzing and deliberating on uh, key issues. And then this uh, GGE um, uh, has indeed um, managed to agree um, in, in, the, in the past, for example, uh, that international law, in particular, the UN Charter, applies to the use of ICT. So, you know, this links up with one of the questions that you, you read out. Uh, it's an interesting question. I would like to perhaps uh, comment on that uh, a little bit later. Um, and also a group has uh, recommended very practical confidence building and capacity building measures. I completely agree with uh, Chris Painter on the importance of capacity building. And, and I think this is something that we still need to, to really develop. Um, this is a critical component of the work ahead. Uh, and in particular, 2015 uh, GGE uh, were also able to recommend uh, 11 voluntary non-binding norms of responsible state behavior uh, in the use of ICTs. Uh, and these norms um, uh, cover key issues including cooperation between states uh, in the use of ICTs, uh, the respect for human rights uh, in the digital sp sphere, um, someone mentioned that also, and the protection of infrastructure, critical infrastructure from, from cyber attacks. And some of these norms, uh, of course, are technical and operational uh, in nature, but also um, you know, do with the responsible reporting of uh, um, ICT uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, as well as uh, um, preventing proliferation of uh, malicious uh, tools and techniques. So they are, you know, uh, uh, good practices um, that are recommended under these norms on the part of uh, 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 private sector industry people. Now, um, in 2018, as, as you all know already, I'm sure, a new uh, GGE has been uh, established under the UN and they are uh, in the middle of their work um, you know, discussing especially um, the strengthening of the norms, but also confidence building uh, and uh, uh, capacity building issues. Uh, and uh, of course, there is a new process, new platform that was established at the UN, which is inclusive. Um, it's called um, Open Ending Working Group. Um, and um, they are also the first group of uh, uh, open ended group working group is still in the process of deliberating and, and bringing it to a conclusion uh, next year. But also uh, very recently, just uh, um, you know, a couple of days ago, uh, the first committee uh, of the General Assembly also uh, decided to uh, create another uh, open ended working group for the duration of uh, five years. Um, so it's, uh, it's very much uh, still work in progress. 
um, but um, but there are some good solid foundations that we have um, you know we have been able to agree on, um, and um, the the key um, in my view uh, is to to make sure that these norms uh, so far agreed to uh, will be fully implemented. Um, I think uh, one thing is to, to have a good normative framework, but another thing uh, which is critical is to making sure that this, this is implemented. And of course, going forward, uh, in order for us to be able to prevent major cyber attacks and cyber incidents, um, I think we need to have confidence building measures and uh, capacity building. Um, and, and this, um, perhaps we will be able to discuss in the, the next, you know, what lies ahead uh, in terms of our key challenges. And one thing that I would add is that uh, we are um, really increasingly uh, aware and actually has acted upon uh, already once uh, in the context of the open edit working group, um, that this has to be taken in the multi-stakeholder uh, um, discussions. This is not really just, uh, you know, governments, you know, cyber diplomats coming and, and discussing, uh, but we need to have a really meaningful engagement uh, of uh, industry people, researchers and, 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 um, and technical people, civil society included. Um, we are still exploring what more we could do uh, in this regard. And I'm, I will be very keen to, to listen to uh, potentially some creative suggestions um, on you know, how the UN can indeed improve on multi-stakeholder-ness, if you will, uh, of those uh, conversations. Uh, as you know, it's not, uh, it has not been so far um, a strength of the United Nations necessarily, uh, but we are acutely aware of that uh, and going forward, we need to make sure that we have meaningful uh, inputs, um, participation uh, from various stakeholders who actually can make um, a, a huge uh, contributions in this. Thank you. Thank you, Izumi, and thank you for your efforts to bridge all of these processes. Your office has been trying to find connecting points on capacity building, sharing information, and it's it's uh, fascinating to, to bridge what, what is political reality and to do maximum out of it for the cybersecurity. There was one question maybe that could be answered later on by you or somebody else. Well, I would say by most of the participants, which from uh, Charlene van der Beek from the from a diplomat here in Geneva, uh, which existing or new forum would be most appropriate in your view to make real global progress on addressing cyber threats? Which features should it include and which should it avoid? That's an interesting question for the complete panel and I would like to invite others to think about it. Now we move to Eugene. Eugene. You, you said uh, initially this very interesting discussion. There are many threads that you can pick uh, from this discussion and comment. Uh, personally, I would like to hear your view on this interplay between policy and technology, security by design, that one point, and maybe one point, I know you are very keen on capacity development and you have your academy, Kaspersky Academy. What would be three points in the curriculum for diplomats and the leaders of the world that you would like that to teach them during one of the courses over to you yeah thank you for the question uh, and actually uh, i have some ideas how to answer some questions you which you already mentioned uh, but in many cases there is no simple answer yes or no uh, in many cases there's something in between so uh, yes and yes uh, and speaking about the importance uh, uh, of uh, cooperation against the cyber crime, uh, how to fight, how to address uh, the cyber threats uh, issues. Uh, I think that uh, they, they have to be three things have to be done: uh, technologies, uh, education, and law enforcement, uh, including the international cooperation. Uh, so actually, I can well I can speak about all these three uh, three vectors of uh, uh, three vectors of fighting the, the uh, cyber threats in the cyberspace. Uh, and uh, well, speaking about the the technologies, I believe uh, that okay. So we, we we know how to protect the computer systems and smartphones, uh, and actually we can we can guarantee very high te technologies can guarantee very very high level of protection. Uh, but if we turn to industrial systems, Internet of Things, uh, and uh, if we Keep in mind that there are more and more and more such a, such a devices around us, uh, gadgets, uh, everything. 
uh, actually it's not possible to develop security, cyber security uh, for you. Uh, fridge, coffee machine, uh, vacuum cleaner, uh, security camera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, actually my uh, idea, the major idea is that uh, we need to develop the systems which are secure by design. Uh, and I call it cyber immunity. Uh, so actually we have this, uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, platform, the, this is operating system, which is quite compact. It's not multifunctional. It's not like Microsoft Windows or Linux. Um, no, <laughs> that's simply not possible to build the security, a true secure or immune scenarios based on these operating systems. Uh, so it's completely different uh, and it's good enough for Internet of Things. Well, actually what we do, uh, uh, we design the architecture of the systems in such a way that it's simply not possible to hack it. Uh, but at the same time, these systems, uh, they are quite flexible. You can update it, uh, you can install it by the applications. Uh, so actually it, it works uh, and we have the first uh, the first inter uh, internet of things the uh, first uh, cyber gadgets uh, sometimes they are quite uh, unique uh, which are developed uh, on top of this uh, immunity platform or immune operating system uh, what <laughs> for example I just have it on my table uh, this is the industrial gateway uh, which can uh, connect the industrial the SCADA system to the internet um, in a secure way. So it's a gateway which is made uh, on this uh, immune uh, immune operating system. Uh, and we have some other stuff, uh, but I'm not going to make the advertisement on this uh, technologies and the products. Uh, well, actually, technically speaking, in for internet of things and for industrial system, for infrastructure, especially critical infrastructure, we can reach such a level of security, then successful attack will cost more than possible damage. So the bad guys, the attackers, they must invest more than possible damage at the victim side. Uh, so I, I named this level of security immunity. So for the uh, bad guys, there is no reason to hack the system. Uh, so technically speaking, uh, it is possible to develop such, such a technologies which you can guarantee uh, that your uh, Internet of Things, your infrastructure, uh, your production lines, they're unhackable. Uh, so it's a first, uh, it's about the technologies. And speaking about international cooperation, it's uh, the first time I said about that it's, it's a must to have international cooperation. There was early 2000, uh, somewhere at the same time, then there was a Budapest convention on the cyber crime was uh, introduced. Uh, maybe I was the first to say internet Interpol uh, to uh, investigate and uh, to find the bad guys in the cyberspace. Uh, so we need to have some kind of the international uh, cyber forces to hunt for the, these guys. Uh, unfortunately, what's going on there, the world is getting uh, unfortunately more fragmented and the ge geopolitical situation is uh, very far from perfect. Uh, and I'm afraid the cooperation between different uh, countries from different parts of the geopolitical landscape, uh, in some cases they're getting worse. Uh, uh, well, actually, I'm not a politician. I'm not the president of the world to, to fix it. Uh, so I just I just do my best uh, to advise uh, others that we need to change that. Uh, we're living, we all are living in a cyber age, in a cyber space. Uh, so to keep this place safe and secure, or at least to move into the direction of the safe uh, internet or the safe cyberspace. Uh, we need to cooperate uh, and forget about geopolitical, st the rest of geopolitical stuff. Uh, in the cyberspace, the nations must cooperate uh, to, well, because, because once again, we're living in the same cyberspace and we're facing very same cyber threats. Uh, and uh, actually their cyber systems, they're getting more important. The infrastructure, uh, critical infrastructure is, uh, depends on cyber more and more. Uh, it's vulnerable and uh, actually that's, uh, uh, the way the world is being developed, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's dangerous. <laughs> uh, so we need, we need to fix it. We need to create uh, the new uh, base, the new ideas, how to build the more trust in the cyberspace and how to make nations to work together against the cyber threats. Thank, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Eugene, for uh, introducing. We have a great dictionary today, cyber immunity, we have uh, Internet uh, Interpol, which is now a bit uh, 
which, as you said, it's it's a historical need for digital for a cooperation across across the board. In the closing, in the next iteration, you may you may give us also the answer to the, this question: What would be curriculum for diplomats and politicians on cybersecurity? Three three major points. We now move to uh, to India to to Lata. Lata, you introduce this interesting concept of trust bubble. You may reflect uh, briefly on that, or any question that has been emerging on, uh, let's say, on geopolitical aspect, on question of uh, of uh, two camps. Uh, Amir Hossein uh, mentioned the two camps and how to how they contribute to the cybersecurity. Just pick one of these questions and reflect on it. But let us more, tell us more about trust bubble. This is an interesting concept. Uh, the, you know, the question of the uh, trust bubble, Jovan, was, uh, you know, to build lasting partnerships uh, and deal effectively with cybersecurity issues, we need strategic partnerships. Uh, that's what I call a trust bubble, or a in fact, we would call it technical bubbles of trust. Uh, what should each country expect from such a partner in a tech bubble? Firstly, you'll have to have political and strategic convergence. Uh, secondly, you would have to have trust in each other's legal and jurisprudence systems. Thirdly, you would have to have a broad-based economic partnership across technology, trade, services, defense, and other key areas. And lastly, is there broad people-to-people -people trust between the peoples of each country? So I think that is absolutely uh, necessary if we are to go forward with this idea of uh, technology bubbles of trust, or in fact, for strategic partnerships between countries. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the, there are concerns today about uh, the technology of trade, for instance. Uh, or, or trade technology. As we saw in 5G, vendors are no longer judged only on price and effectiveness, but also on location and geopolitical tensions. There are concerns about the country of origin and the prevailing legal systems in that country. Uh, and of course, the relationship with that country. Uh, therefore, it's no longer run purely on commercial considerations. And this certainly will present a lot of difficulties for sellers and buyers. And I think this is where the bubbles of trust will play an even greater role. I'm sorry, Yovan, I've forgotten the second question you asked me. Was there anything else no. you wanted me to comment on? No, uh, the, there was one question by Charlene, which was asked, what would be, there should be the fora? Do we need to create one? One for to discuss cybersecurity, multiply where that coordination should happen on the global level. That's let's say policy geopolitical question. I think that was one of the comments in the in chat. Well, I certainly think that uh, we do need to coordinate our efforts uh, in so many different fora. You know, there is a huge multiplicity of effort. Uh, and uh, we are uh, having dialogues in so many different fora, whether it's the Paris Peace Forum, the IGF, uh, our own global commissions, which I worked on, and uh, any number of think tanks, etc. So in one sense, it would be good to have a body come together where all these efforts could be coordinated and classified together. But... Uh, I think it'll be very difficult because at the moment there's not much appetite to create another international mechanism and uh, certain countries would certainly be opposed to creating a, a global uh, internationally recognized body uh, to deal with these cyber issues. Thank you, Lata. That was one of the question of high level panel that was probably one of the underlying and most challenging questions, whom to call to address your digital issues, not only cybersecurity, but in general digital issues, which is a huge challenge for small and developing countries. While big countries, uh, we have many for us, but we may get to that point uh, to uh, in the in the next uh, with uh, with uh, John John, well, whom businesses can call to address their digital issues and all of these concerns. Or you can pick on any 
any other 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 points from our discussion? Well, well straight up, there's. Um, I think if anyone said there was one person to call, I, I think that there would be grossly misleading. So I think that's the first point to make. Look, um, I might just uh, open this intervention by saying this 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 time twelve months ago, I actually was at the IGF and I launched uh, one of the. Uh, famous uh, ICC campaigns to make technology work for all. And I did that because we recognize, I think as we all do, the, the digital divide. But the point I want to focus on today is there's also a, a capability divide, which we actually need to think about in terms of digital capacity divide as well. And I think that's been touched on a bit by um, Eugene and also by Lata so far. Um, uh, the, the, where I'm getting to here is that um, uh, what we see too often now and uh, is the absence of an effective uh, regulatory framework, both at a policy level and at a legal level to actually encompass and enable the kind of things that we wanna see on cyber. And that's something that we see as, a, as a, uh, an element which is missing, not everywhere, but in many, many economies and in many respects, even in some surprising economies. The private sector can do so much but in the end, to create these, these frameworks, these policy frameworks, which are capable of being implemented uh, both by regulation and by law, we actually need governments to step up. And we still see too many governments without that capacity. And so the, the private sector simply cannot do the heavy lifting at all uh, on its own. Uh, but the point I would make there is that even in developed countries, and this partly picks up, I think, the comment that Azumi was made uh, much earlier on, if you want to develop good policy, even good policy frameworks in developed countries, you can't do it in isolation. Best policy always has a strong business voice in it and civil society, and in particular when it comes to issues like digital. Uh, and the reason for that is that ultimately we have to implement it. So if you don't involve the end users or the key stakeholders in the development of policy, then you'll always end up with difficulties. And that's just in developed countries. But in developing countries, we also need, and also I shouldn't say this is only reserved for developing countries because there are a number of developed countries without, I think, the requisite framework in place. We need to work together and they need to acknowledge that if, um, if we need to call anyone, it's gotta be someone who is actually able to encapsulate civil society, the private sector and government and put the citizen at the center in order to achieve this. So in a way, it's almost the holy trinity that we actually need to have in place to deliver on this, this outcome. And so one of the questions or one of the observations made in the chat was that in order to help um, SMEs and micro SMEs combat cyber, we should, we should look to the wonderful tools from the Cyber Readiness Institute. Please be assured we are doing so. Please be assured that that is something we see as critical. You know, and please be assured that the ICC, we have five years ago, we actually preempted this debate by the standards that we created and the guidance we gave out. That still rings true. I was just looking at some of the points we made in our guidance uh, five years ago, and it actually still, uh, a vision the companies should adopt, a holistic approach, looking at effective risk mitigation and preparation to breaches. All the elements we talked about there and a more detailed paper are all still relevant. So I hope that's useful to you, but it's actually ensuring that there is this stakeholder engagement in the formation of project of policy and regulations and law, but actually governments ultimately need to act, but we need to help them act as best as possible with all those inputs. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for bringing more precision to multi-stakeholder approach. Sometimes we stay on the general notion, but you you zoom you zoomed in in the in both reasons and practicalities how multi-stakeholder approach can function. And I think this is an under-researched and under-discussed issue because if you want multi-stakeholder approach to flourish, is we need to we need really to to zoom and to develop a procedure and the approach is much 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 better. Uh, we will be moving now to Chris, but Chris, you you can think on the few questions that remain unanswered. There was a question on two camps. There is a comments from Wolfgang, very interesting as always from Wolfgang uh, Kleinwachter. Uh, UNGG and Open Energy Working Group are important. Probably some progress can be reached in the next two years. Optimistic view. Let's hear from the from the panelists uh, if they share the optimism uh, from Wolfgang. But we should discuss 
also uh, progress in the in the laws and the little autonomous weapon uh, system group the regional wars of today from libya to calculus uh, uh, are test bad how ai and internet based devices drone and robots can be integrated in the military operation there has to be the, there has to be discussed also in multi stakeholder environment as always uh, challenging thoughts from the volgang chris a lot on your plate to so, come to geopolitics volgang go ahead I love Wolfgang, but but look, I think all these issues are going to increasingly be multi-stakeholder, and they're increasingly going to be interrelated as well. And, and I want to pick up uh, on one thing that was just said by John, which is, it is important to have multi-stakeholders, different stakeholders as we, as we develop policy. And this is one of the things that the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise tries to do. When we talk to countries, for instance, about having national strategies, which is often the, the document that shows it's a priority for that country, as the organizing document for that country, that they should create that strategy by talking to a number of stakeholders, not just government stakeholders, but industry, academia, civil society, that that's the best practice. And we try to try to uh, showcase that. Uh, I'd say a couple other things too. I, I don't agree uh, using a term I've used before that we need one ring to rule them all, that we need one giant institution that's gonna take up all these issues. Frankly, it would collapse on its own weight. It would be too complex too hard to actually have any effective uh, uh, function. And I think what we need to do is make the existing dialogues we have, including in the UN, more effective rather than trying to create a new one. Um, you know, I, I, I similarly think that, you know, one of the questions was about, do we need a new, uh, a binding cybercrime treaty or cybersecurity treaty? And I have the same feeling about that. We are still in the early uh, throes of this issue. We need to focus on things like, what are the expectations? What are the rules of the road? What are the norms? getting countries to follow those. We could think about something down the line, but you know, a treaty doesn't solve our issues in this space either. You know, people violate, countries violate existing treaties. Uh, so, so that doesn't make, you have a treaty and everything goes away. We need to think about what the rules of the road are and get some consensus around that and get those implemented. I think that's critically important. Uh, and you know, uh, I guess the, the other issue is, uh, two other issues, one was on cyber, Someone talked about a, uh, you mentioned uh, to Latha or someone else, I think, oh, uh, Eugenie, about the idea of a course for cyber diplomats. Well, that is critically important. Uh, we did that internally when I was in the State Department. We trained officers around the world. We brought them all back to DC. We had Vint talk to them. We had uh, people talking about geopolitical issues so that they were trained in that. Uh, Estonia has been doing a good job on that, training diplomats on cyber, uh, and they've had several programs. Your organization has been doing work on that. Unidir has been doing good work on that. This is an important issue to get these people up to speed. And that's another thing that the GFC is, is, is focused on. And then the final question I'll take a swing at is the, uh, the one of, you know, do, uh, there are two camps, managing conflict and preventing conflict. I, I don't think that's really true. I think those things merge, right? Uh, if we think that cyber tools are not gonna be used for offensive operations uh, that may be a, a fanciful way to think of, of the world, but that's not going to happen, right? We, we, there's no way that's going to happen. So how do we, just like we do in other areas, control this and make sure that conflict doesn't occur? So part of controlling conflict and having rules of the road, international law and norms is to prevent conflict. So, and, and we should be working toward that. So I don't see those as opposite things. I see those as merging together. So, so yeah. I did, tried to hit a lot of different issues in that short, uh, that short blur, but uh, thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Please help me not to become persona non grata with the IGF Secretariat because of time management. But it is such a, such a unique opportunity to have a so good uh, speakers and inspiring speakers and, and, and very good question. From Christian Roy, a question on the, on the funding and the skeptical view about, about the need for the, any sort of a centralization in that respect. And it, it has been elephant in the room, if I can say, small or big elephant to use the, that, uh, that metaphor, uh, do we need a central, a central space? And uh, then uh, there was a question, interesting question for Mark uh, Carvel uh, from a uh, former UK uh, leading digital uh, diplomat, uh, recently retired. Should IGF Plus establish a dedicated observatory for cybersecurity that provides policy and technical advice, education, skill, capacity, building resources? This is an interesting uh, issue. Probably building inputs from GFC, other, other existing initi initiative. Great work of Singapore, by the way, 
uh, in the field of cybersecurity and training. Therefore, that's one of the one of the concrete question and suggestion. Uh, discussion is really moving fast in the chat, and we have ten minutes now. Uh, I will just give a chance to uh, to Enrico. Enrico, uh, so many questions from discussion. Uh, uh, help me to to stay within the, the next ten minutes uh, limits of this session. With your uh, your uh, your comment, pick on any of the these leads in our discussion, and uh, and uh, comment on it. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jovan. I'll try to be uh, very brief. Uh, I would like then to to um, maybe to expand a little bit on uh, on this idea of the cyber observatory at the UN. So, um, as a researcher, uh, I truly believe that um, you know the uh, the domain of the of the cyberspace um, cannot be isolated by um, uh, unique national and regional contexts. Uh, that somehow can create uh, a distinct set um, of uh, challenges. And, and this is through research uh, that you can uh, identify then different maybe priorities and mechanisms for, uh, for governing cybersecurity within national jurisdiction. So also, you, uh, you know, to fight against cyber crimes is a complex task that requires multilateral and multi-stakeholder uh, dialogues. It's really important to understand, I think, through research uh, the cyber threat landscape, um, and uh, so that the response is really uh, designed in an evidence-based and, and, and informed way. Um, and I think it's also important then that, that you know once you are able to collect this evidence uh, and identify uh, an informed response, uh, cyber policy somehow have to be um, uh, human-centric. So, um, you know, we, we do want to, to build more uh, resilience, but the first step is really then to empower the internet users, as a number of speakers uh, have said as well. And, and a resilience can be seen as, as a function of capacity. And, uh, and so internet resilience, um, I think it's a function of, of cyber capacity. Um, as we've seen, you know, during the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, and uh, I mean, during the history of the internet, the internet infrastructure actually is, is a resilient um, network. Uh, you know, has been keep working under um, and under pressure and also under several attacks. It's still here, up and running, and it works every time better and better and faster. But uh, so what actually we do need to to build is the human resilience because it seems that actually is the human security at risk. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, th there is a problem of people's vulnerability. So, um, I don't know if you, for instance, see developing countries, you know, the landscape there is that the technology is updated, it's not scrutinized, um, uh, there are very low security standards in devices, in practice, um, in software, and there are really no measure to uh, mitigate and advance threat. So, considering that, that the people can be the first line of defense against threat, um, is the most vulnerable, you know, that we should try to protect and, uh, and educate. And so uh, cybersecurity um, policy, I think it should really aim at providing safe and security access and use um, of the internet by building this human resilience and protecting, of course, the human rights online. Just one, one final comment on uh, this entity, you know, that should somehow uh, I think create and um, trust um, in, in cyberspace. I think that, you know, in the current landscape of tension, um, the UN, from my perspective, is recognized by a number of countries and especially uh, developing countries as this kind of center of gravity. And I'm quoting here um, Dr. Mashabani from uh, from South Africa. Developing countries feel they can really, you know, sit at the table um, of the UN. And so I believe that at that level, it's important to build a global consensus on the governance of cyberspace. But what needs to change from my perspective is that this traditionally multilateral mechanism should encourage a wider participation, uh, both from developing countries that, you know, uh, that are not always capacitated to meaningfully participate um, in this kind of debates, and of course, to have also a broader dialogue with a number of non-state actors, including civil society organizations, the technical community, and others, so that all together we really can, we can define you know, these principles, norms, and rules for, uh, for a safe and secure cyberspace that at the end is truly inclusive and secure.
Thank you. Enrico, thank you. thank you for this. You have support from Christiane Roy on the human-centered cybersecurity. And you mentioned human security in your first intervention, which is somehow forgotten in the international parlance, but it is an extremely inter interesting concept. I know it is supported a lot by Switzerland also because of the humanitarian aspect. Now, uh, Enrico, we will start with you uh by asking you to make a voluntary commitment be very careful because the uh, secretary is, is taking good evidence whatever we promise and uh, hopefully next igf will be in situ therefore we have to deliver on that 30 seconds for your voluntary commitment till the next igf yeah, so my, my voluntary commitment is to keep growing this uh, need of, uh, of data, of evidence and of information for the development of uh, evidence-based uh, cyber policy making. So I'm committing myself to work more towards that. Okay, Cengita, I'm, I'm sure you took this note. Thank you for that. Uh, Chris, what is your, uh, your uh, voluntary commitment? Uh, I'm going to commit on behalf of both for myself and my organization. Uh, to increase our regional focus in Africa and make our efforts more efficient and effective, and overall really raise the awareness and level, political level of cyber and cyber capacity building. We hope to hold a conference on this. It's still in the planning, so I can't announce it now, but I can announce what I just announced, and we'll, we'll do all we can to do that. Great. Thank you, Chris. John, over to you. Thanks very much. Well, we commit to work with our members and partners to ensure that access to internet and digital technology works on three layers of the digital ecosystem, on infrastructure, applications, and skills, to work with policymakers to improve their understanding of how ICTs actually work in practice, to co-create incentives for investment and innovation to develop, roll out, and maintain tools and solutions to secure meaningful access for underserved communities and vulnerable groups, co-design frameworks that enable connectivity based on light touch ICT policy and regulations, encouraging competition, and enabling the entry of new players into the ICT ecosystem and to mobilize our amazing network of 45 million companies, 12,000 chambers of commerce to get all this done. Thank you, John. We will follow line by line next year when we meet at the, at the IGF. Uh, uh, Lata, um, um, what, is, uh, what is commitment from the, your side? In addition to write a good blog post about trust bubble, it requires. This Thank is you. commitment that I'm, I'm sort of imposing because okay. I think it's a great concept. Please go ahead, I'm joking. <laughs> as a cyber peace warrior, as I like to call myself, my commitment is to continue my work on increasing international cooperation, more democratic internet, internet governance frameworks, and on formulating cyber norms. We need to coordinate and consolidate our national, regional, plurilateral and global efforts to achieve the goal of keeping cyberspace as safe and stable as we can. That's my commitment. Thank you, uh, Lata. Eugene, uh, what, uh, what you can uh, promise till the next IGF for our community? Oh, cybersecurity trainings for two UEN cyber diplomats. Oh, great. And we will develop yeah, okay. a Yes, and uh, actually, I think that we'll do it a very funny way. Uh, actually, we have a different trainings uh, on cybersecurity. Uh, one of them is uh, like it's a table game. It's like a monopoly game uh, where there is a ent uh, enterprise which is under cyber attack, uh, and you are like CTO of the company of this enterprise. Uh, you have budget, you have options, you have time, and you must survive. Wow, that's so really we can provide this kind of trainings for you, Ian. Cyber diplomats, and it's really, really funny game. Thank you. That's great to learn by uh, with with the fun by playing games, and I'm I'm sure that I will follow up uh, directly on this uh, this uh, voluntary commitment because it's so so interesting. Thank you, uh, Izumi. We are concluding commitment uh, uh, voluntary commitment list with uh, with you. What we can uh, expect from uh, from your side, please. Uh, thank you. Before that, Eugene, definitely also, I would like to follow up on your offer as well. So uh, uh, from, um, from our perspectives, uh, obviously in line with the Secretary General's agenda for disarmament and, and also Tunis agenda, um, I will continue um, to the best of my ability, my efforts to promote a global uh, culture of self uh, cybersecurity. 
um, and that we do by continuing and, and, and further increasing uh, our engagements with member states uh, to help uh, foster a culture of accountability, um, one another keyword, and also adherence and uh, implementation of uh, the, the, the norms that we talked about, rules and principles on uh, responsible behavior in the use of IT ICTs. Also, um, I commit to uh, further increase our engagement with other stakeholders, including businesses, industry, uh, civil society, uh, and, and um, tech people uh, in general. And I would like to actually add a second uh, bit of my commitment. Um, it didn't come up today, but uh, I would like to make a commitment to promoting the full and equal and meaningful participation of women in all decision-making processes related to this extremely important uh, issue of cybersecurity. We already do have a shortage of uh, uh, you know, cybersecurity capacity, in particular um, uh, female capacities, and we need to do all sorts of uh, different kinds of efforts to bring up new um, capacities um, and uh, also uh, making sure that women are involved in decision-making processes as well. Thank you, thank you, Izumi, for great news, and thank you for uh, to all of our panelists for helping me to uh, uh, remain in good books of the IGF Secretariat because we are finishing on time. And uh, thank you for a great attendance. I think the questions were excellent. I uh, try to answer a few questions. I ignore one question by Vlada Radunovic because he works for my organization. Although it was a great question, but he can uh, he can tolerate me ignoring his uh, his question. It was really great discussion. Uh, we uh, should uh, discuss serious issues also with some fun. And Eugene's uh, commitment to uh, learn on cybersecurity via game is great. And I would like uh, on this note to uh, thank you uh, for organizing it. Thank, uh, special thanks go to the IGF Secretariat, uh, UNDESA, all people who put a lot of efforts behind, uh, behind this uh, session. Uh, and uh, the ECU or see you in person, uh, hopefully next year for a discussion on commitment and uh, for having some fun. For time being, I will have to, I have to uh, share with you virtually this drink, uh, but next year we may develop whatever, peer to beer or beer to beer network and uh, discuss serious issues uh, in relaxing setting, which is uh, in traditional diplomacy also a way to make a breakthroughs. Have a nice uh, day, um, evening, uh, late night for uh, for uh, for Lata. It's almost 1.30 and uh, see you soon. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you very much, Jovan, and thank you very much, panelists. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.